You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. And I have uh, Dr. John Krakauer. He's at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Department of Neurology. Dr. Krakauer, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, so tell me about the Brain Learning Animation and Movement Lab, the BLAM Lab. Right. So we are a lab um, based in the neurology department at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and we are quite broad ranging in what we do. We are, in broadest sense, interested in movement in health and disease. So how do you plan, control, and learn movements in health? And then what happens to planning, controlling, and learning movements after brain injury? Uh, And we're interested in the science of movement and thinking of new ways to treat people and rehabilitate them after they lose movement. When you say movement, you don't mean exercise. You mean physical movement, like walking, or uh, we're mostly we're mostly interested in we're we're mostly interested in reaching and grasping. That's right. We're interested in control of the arm and of the hand, and in skilled movement of the arm and hand. We don't really do lower body. There are other people at Hopkins that we collaborate do, but we're really arm and hand. So, what uh, what kind of conditions cause a, a loss of movement? And you know, tell me a little bit about it. What happens? Well, uh, stroke uh, is a major cause of loss of control of the arm and hand, Uh, cervical spine injury, brain trauma, Parkinson's disease, cerebellar ataxia, multiple sclerosis. So uh, there are many neurological diseases and also injuries that uh, will affect your ability to move your arm and hand. Um, But we focus, our main core disease that we study um, is stroke. So what happens when... um you know, when someone has a stroke, for instance, like what physically happens to cause a loss of the ability to move properly? Well, uh, stroke, you know, is when you lose blood and oxygen to a particular part of the brain. A very common part of the brain that affected is the uh, the motor areas and its output. So commonly after a stroke, people will become weak uh, and they will also lose dexterity. So even if they have not complete weakness, they'll also just become clumsy. And then you can also develop additional symptoms called synergies, where you you have these unwanted movements that sort of interfere with your ability to isolate your joints. So it's really a combination of weakness, dexterity loss, and a kind of movement disorder where you get these intrusive movement patterns. All of these are attributable to losing parts of your brain uh, that transmit out to your spinal cord. Well, unintended movements, you mean like tremors or um, shaking or... Not so much uh, that. Jerking, I mean, it, it, not so much that. It's, it's, for example, you know, you try and um, extend at the elbow and your shoulder flexes. Um, you try and just move your hand and your whole arm moves. So you lose the ability to isolate and individuate particular joints. You try and move one finger and all your fingers close. So you, you basically get these intrusive, unwanted additional movements while you try to make, make a voluntary movement. So stroke patients have, have find it very difficult um, to you know, move one finger and keep the other still, the other fingers get enslaved and go along for the ride. So you try and just flex your forefinger and all your fingers flex. So it's these interesting. Yeah, I've had injuries movement. myself, and uh, yeah, you're right. It is hard to isolate certain muscles, and I've had you know a surgery or two where you want to move a certain muscle and you literally can't. Like you just can't make it move, and you don't. You feel like you've lost the connection temporarily to make something move. So I understand right, and that's what happens early after stroke, and then when movement ability comes back, it can't be as as you just said. You you can't isolate things as well. Other things come along for the ride, and that's sort of what I mean by this additional fact that there's loss, like you just described, and then there's this unwanted intrusion that comes along with the return. So, what do you think is happening physically to cause that? 
Well, we sort of have an idea that humans are particularly dependent on something called the cortical spinal tract, which is the projection from your motor cortex in your brain down through your brain stem to your spinal cord, and it connects you directly up to muscles. And that gives us all the dexterity that we have, which is better even than chimpanzees. But the price we pay for having this system is that if you damage it, you're devastated. So what seems to happen is that you lose this descending pathway that's special in humans uh, when you interrupt it anywhere along its path after a stroke. So what you know, what happens uh, in a stroke? Well, there are two kinds of strokes. I mean, the, 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 the most common kind that makes up about 85% of strokes is where a blood vessel um, is blocked by a clot or by atherosclerosis. And so that part of your brain loses blood and oxygen and dies. So you basically, a stroke is loss of brain tissue through deprivation of blood and oxygen. Uh, that's the most common kind of stroke. And there are many causes for that, you know, uh, cardiac conditions and other things. And then there are hemorrhagic strokes where you basically burst a blood vessel rather than block it. And so you bleed. Uh, and that also can have the same effect because the blood exerts pressure on brain structures and even kills them. So whether you deprive an area um, of blood and oxygen or you flood it with high pressure blood, the consequences can be very similar. So how does it, how does it cause loss of motion? Is it just because the brain's not able to send signals properly, even though the, uh, the plumbing is still there, I guess, for... A crude way to put it. Yeah, it just it, you you've basically killed tissue that's projecting down to the spinal cord, right? You've either interrupted the cables, the white matter, or you've killed the gray matter. But it's it's basically death of neural tissue. So, what are you learning? Are ways to modulate this effect? Well, we're just trying to find ways to um, have people try and get better with what they have left. In other words, you never lose everything, uh, and then we need, you need to find a way to sort of up modulate and amplify the control abilities you have left with the remaining areas of your brain that have not been damaged. And what we think is that you need to really exploit that residual capacity by doing very intense rehabilitation very early after the stroke because there's a diminishing return as time goes by uh, to try and exploit these residual connections. So our main idea is that if you can come up with new emotionally gratifying, motivating, enhancing behaviors that you can do early, uh, then you can best exploit those residual connections. Because most people, you know, even after injury don't do enough, you know, most people have, you know, not most, but 40% of people who buy gym memberships never go. Uh, I had surgery on my shoulder and didn't even like doing a little bit of rehab, but they told me I should do at home. So we need to find ways to really motivate people early to give them large amounts of exercise and practice to sort of exploit these connections you have left. And that's what we're really after, is how do we do that? Well, I mean, one is to you know, put the fear of God into them and say, hey, if you don't work on this for six months and rehab it at least three times a week, for instance, then you may have permanent loss of function or you may not be able to do anything. Yeah, I think we, there's, been a, there's been a lot of research over decades showing that that kind of distal warning doesn't work as well as the thing itself being fun. So, you know, lots and lots of people smoke, even though they can be told you're going to get lung cancer and die, they still smoke. And the, the best ways to actually get people to quit smoking is not putting the fear of God in them so much as making it difficult to smoke. You can't smoke in restaurants, you can't smoke in cinemas, you can't smoke in public spaces. So in other words, the sheer inconvenience and the expense of buying them seems to be more effective than telling, you know, showing them pictures of blackened lungs and things like that. So similarly, we need to mm. find a way not just to work on fear, but to make people actually enjoy doing the rehabilitation so that they want to do it. So is your goal to minimize the amount of rehab you have to do, or is it to gamify the experience so that more people Yeah, do that's it? a good, it's more the second. It's more to sort of find ways to gamify it and to vary it up and make it immersive so that people actually don't, you trick people basically into doing the intensity and doses that they need. That, that is the approach we're taking. Yeah. So, literally, you know, the basic idea, you know, is to make you be the expert athlete of your injury. You know, expert athletes and musicians practice five, six hours a day. And they, for two reasons, they enjoy the practice and they know that it will help them be excellent. Uh, and we need to find people a way to make people realize that after injury, essentially, you have to become an elite athlete of your injury. And we admire athletes for what they do, we mistakenly call it, you know, talent or giftedness. But what we're really impressed by is that they were willing to make the sacrifice to 
practice five or six hours a day at the expense of everything else. Michael Phelps would practice five or six hours in the pool and he'd be bored to death and he'd much rather be out on the town. But he was able to sort of forego those things for the practice. And uh, that's, I think, what we need to try and tap into, even in patients, let alone athletes. Well, that's a tough hurdle. I mean, you know, rehab of a half hour a day, I'm sure people don't want to do. How do you get them to do five, six hours of the equivalent? I mean, do you have... Yes, like, I know, I know. It's a, it, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I don't... That's a great question. I mean, how do you get people to do more things? You know, the basic idea is whoever changes behavior wins. I mean, this is true for getting people to lose weight, quit smoking, exercise. I mean, it's the same for rehab. Is how do you get people to make behavioral change? It's much easier to take a pill or whip out an organ with surgery. But behavioral change over the long term, which is probably what's needed, um, is tough. And, you know, gamification is one way, I think. Well, what other ways are you exploring? Like, what have you specifically figured out? What have you tried? Well, we've developed games of our own, uh, and we are basically trying to get people to play them. You know, we did a little trial um, for people early after stroke. And people like it. In other words, I think what, what the, the real issue here is when it comes to gamification is for people who are old or sick, they tend to be told to recycle games and devices which were meant for other people, like the Wii or, you know, use a PlayStation or off-the-shelf games, and I think what we need to do is we need to sort of accept that we need to deliberately focus on these people and build games for them, uh, and that's what we're trying to do, is what kind of games would you want to develop um, that are specifically geared towards what we've been talking about, and that's what we did. We basically made people play games where they were dolphins, and that was what we started with, and people seem to like that. They like the idea of being in the ocean, they like the the blueness of it all, they like the movement, and it seems to be a way of making them make miles of our movements without even realizing they're doing it. So that's yeah, what sort of, uh, for a joke, the, uh, the gamification of Thrones, you would adapt the story yeah. to that. Yes, you could, we, we do want them to be also uh, in stories. That's absolutely true. We, 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 do do, we do do that, and they become characters, and they begin to believe they are the characters, which is great. But the whole idea of making people star in their own rehab is is very new, right? I mean, how does be part of a story? I always say in my talks, if you're going to be sick, you might as well enjoy it. And people find that weird. Well, can you get together cohorts of people that um, have had a stroke and have them work together in a multiplayer game? That's a really, that is exactly what we're trying. That's exactly, that's a very good idea. Yeah, um, precisely. I mean, there have been stroke groups for ages where people share their stories and their suffering, what's happened, but this, you know what this, actually would be cool is um, depending on what happens to someone and what limb is affected, for instance, that's the character they become in a game. And that character has certain abilities, but it also, you know, so the character has to be used in such a way that would help them. Let's say it's a shoulder problem, you know, or a, a leg problem. The character has to uh, act in such a way as to use their abilities and have them rehab themselves. That's right. That's exactly what we've been. That 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 is. You you are you are very quick. I mean, that's exactly what we are doing. We're we're isolating particular parts of the body to particular characters, and that's exactly right. You have to do it that way, uh, and by doing it with others, it's competitive. So yes, you're 100 percent right. That's exactly the intuition. That's cool. That would be a lot of fun. I could definitely see people doing that, competing online. Right. And, uh, it, 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 <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but it, it, it has to be. But it's, you know, to do that so that it meets the standards that you would want, in other words, as you imagine it in your head right now, it takes a lot of work. In other words, you, you want it to be high production values. And that's hard because usually we just, you know, it, most tech for patients is kind of hand-me-down. We're much more interested in making high production value products for teenagers who are well than for elderly people who are sick. Well, also remember certain games that are popular, you know, they're popular for a reason, like Angry Birds and stuff like that. So, you know, reinventing the wheel may be difficult. It might be better to modify and get licensing from existing things that are super popular and just modify them. Sure, it's just that the the companies, I mean, they're, you know, we could go into details of why I don't think some of these games actually hit the spot with respect to brain plasticity, but also, you know, many of these companies are very wary of getting into the medical space because suddenly you'd get regulated, right? And so, um, and you don't want to make any claims, and if you do make claims, I mean, Lumosity were slammed with a big fine when they claimed that their games would be helpful for memory loss. 
So a lot of companies sort of shy away from the medical space. They're much more interested in the wellness space. Um, now yeah, you're right. Of, you can you go ahead. Yeah, you want to avoid claims, but I mean, you can still put the modified game out there and just say it's uh, it's for use by people with a certain condition. You know, you don't promise anything. Or is that not enough to to say that? I, I, I think it's a large investment to sort of modify a game and then have to market it and 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 then get it to that audience. I mean, it's just not been. I mean, I we feel like you need to sort of do it from the bottom up and just develop them. But you know, it's a mixture. There have been data on you know first-person shooter games having beneficial effects, mainly in healthy people. Um, but yes, I mean, you're, you're intuiting the difficulty of this space. You're, you know, th- th- this is, uh, not only is the science difficult and the actual treatment hard, but the model that one should develop in order to do the things we've been discussing is itself needs like 10 MBAs. <laughs> well, also to the age of the people that have the conditions you're dealing with, you know, they might not want to play first-person shooters. You know, if they're That's older, exactly they might want to you know, do something else. That's right. Exactly right. In other words, you have to be very much aware that they may want more zen-like, nice experiences. Um, and even though the average age of people who game is getting older, I mean, the, the average age now is in the mid-30s. And, and many people who have strokes, you know, over the age of 65 have never been gamers. So there are lots of challenges. And we've done our own internal research in terms of what people like. And they don't always want it to be, you know, battle zones. Right. Yeah. Well, what about traditional activities like painting or other things like that? You know, yeah, that's so really that's game, that, yeah, that's absolutely true. It, it's um, you know, there's music therapy, there's art therapy, there's dancing. I mean, all these things are probably projecting down to a similar overlapping space. The question is how to scale it, how to keep the intensity and dosage up, how to avoid boredom. It's, uh, not every hospital in every country is going to be able to have the artists or the spaces to do that. So one thing is is to try and use technology to make it scalable. Does insurance pay for this or can they be coerced uh, into paying for this? No, it's a big problem. Uh, There's a big problem, right? In other words... If you use a technology just as an adjunct to a therapist, therapists have a designated amount of time available, and so no amount of technology is going to be able to make up for the fact that the therapist cannot spend enough time with the patient. So, you know, either you find ways to not require therapists there, they do things at home, for example, um, or you have to change the reimbursement structure. Some countries are more flexible than others. The United States is particularly inflexible because it's really economic considerations that drive rehab rather than scientific ones. So it's a real uphill struggle. You could even say you've got evidence and it's still difficult. I mean, people say that it takes on average about 17 years to get from a piece of good evidence to changing medical practice. So it's an uphill struggle no matter how good your data are. Well, maybe the key is informing communities where people have uh, like afflictions and, you know, including the gamification within the community. Literally membership in a community, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, sometimes we think about that, sort of Uberizing it, right? In other words, instead of sort of saying it has to go all the way through as you make it minimum risk enough, and then people just begin to ask for it in their communities, and you sort of short circuit the entire reimbursement system. It all boils down to whether people want to pay for things out of pocket, even if they're reasonable compared to going through their insurance. And if their insurance only covers a piece, they may say, well, that might be good enough, or they're going to top it up themselves. It's, it's, there's a lot of, there's work suggesting that if people think they get even a piece of a treatment through their insurance, they'd rather just do that and not pay extra. It's, it's fascinating. Well, there's got to be a reason that you're doing this and a, and a way to do it. You know, I mean, it, you could say like you're in a, a thankless position, so why do it, you know? I mean, oh, I, I, I think that worldwide, I'm optimistic. I, I agree with you. I think that I think worldwide, one can. There are lots of different ways one can do it. There are lots of avenues to pursue. Overall, I think if you're, what you're doing is right and people like it and it helps people, eventually in some venue, in some place, in some way, it, it goes. And uh, that's what I have to believe. Otherwise, you're right. I would I would just be soaked in pessimism. <laughs> Well, how far have you gotten? Have you gotten any good results with a cohort of people? And, you know, sure. You- I mean, we've, we've, we've did a small trial uh, with the dolphin and the acute stroke patients, and we've got positive results, which we're writing up right now. We've, we've run uh, about a dozen patients in an assisted living facility to see whether it's tolerable and enjoyable for the healthy elderly. Um, we're beginning to look at other patient populations with it. So, yes, I think we're on the right track. Okay. Very good. What, 
So what's coming for you in the next uh, year or so? New projects or whether add-ons you work on? Yeah, we're, we're, we're building new tech. In other words, we're going to roll out a sort of 2.0 version of our creatures. We're going to uh, do something for the hand, and we're going to expand the conditions we're going to look at. We're going to try and do some small phase two studies in TBI, multiple sclerosis, HIV, um, and then try and do bigger trials in stroke, in chronic and acute stroke. So it's really perfecting the platform, increasing the number of characters and experiences. Um, and the other thing we're working on, which is very exciting, is we're trying to sort of build the hospital room of the future. In other words, not just have platforms, but sort of turn rooms more into like little spaceships that you can walk into, sort of inspired by the sort of the hollow deck in Star Trek. You know, wouldn't it be great if instead of a hospital room, it felt more like an arcade? That's the kind of thing we're also working on here at Hopkins. Well, it seems like this would lend itself to VR. You know, that would be yep. a huge way to do this. You know, like if you, you know, let's say I, <clears throat> I hurt my shoulder and I remember the exercises I did, you know, if I'm in VR, I could have a virtual trainer that tells me, do this, do that, try to move your shoulder this way. I could even show, you know, an image of myself doing the movements uh, as I'm doing it and if you show the muscles or like a cutaway. I mean, be, there could be a lot of things with VR. I would think that would Maybe yeah, we 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 have a VR stuff. version. We have a VR version of of our game. Um, so yeah, I mean VR is one p p potential way. I mean the thing about VR is sometimes you have to see why that's better than reality itself. Uh, sometimes I feel too many VR experiences just replicas of reality, and it's a very interesting distinction and a very interesting conversation to have. What is the difference between VR versus gaming and VR hasn't really taken off yet as something that people like to have as a gaming experience, um, but I think it's in its early days, and that will probably change. Okay. Well, very good. So what's the best way for folks to find out more and to get in touch? And, you know, well, the best way, I think, is to go to our website. So it's www.blam-lab.org, and we have contact information in all our media appearances and our scientific manuscripts and you know work that we've done. Uh, and then there's also, you can go to Hopkins and go to the Kata Design Studio, K-A-T-A -A Design Studio, and that will also give information about the kind of games I'm making. All right, great. And Blam is B-L-A-M dash... Hyphen, org. yeah, lab, blamlab.org, yeah. Blam lab, okay, very good. Well, Dr. Krakauer, thanks for coming. I really Not at all. It. Thank you so much. It was great fun. And take care. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.